Hey, Charger fans, welcome into the Guilty as Charged podcast. My name is Steven. I'm your host. As always, we are presented by the Blue Wire Podcast Network. And joining me are Tyler and Alex. Alex, I noticed you're wearing a, a Chargers jersey today. Had to, had to mix it up from the Sixers jersey, huh? Yeah, I had to mix it up. And, you know, the whole playoff run is uh, pending on the status of one man's knee. Uh, so that's a thing. <laughs> but the Lakers are down 3-2, so y'all aren't doing too much better, so... Well, I mean, to be fair, I don't think Tyler and I are either Lakers fans. I just uh, you live just... in California. I have to bully someone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely not a great time to be a Laker fan. But Tyler, how are you doing today, man? I'm a Lakers fan in the sense that I do live in California and I'm not rooting for the Clippers. So by process <laughs> of elimination, I'm a Lakers fan. Uh, I'm doing very well. I'm not doing as well as my mom, who I found out weeks ago had bought amc because she just thought it would be a really good long-term stock and she had no idea about any of this stuff and so she's up like five grand now and i'm a little jealous hey well according to drew tranquil that's a poor decision um oh so yeah (laughs) i've had had a mixed history with that because i bought it at 12 dollars, then i sold it then i bought it at 30 and i'm up 30 dollars now so (laughs) double your money pump it Well, uh, how's your mom going to spend that extra five grand? Um, I don't know. On her horse. <laughs> <laughs> Buy a horse. <laughs> she got... uh, yeah, pretty much. Nice. And uh, and how's your sister doing after the, the horse accident? Uh, she's doing as well, as far as I can tell. Uh, if she had more pain, she would have had to go in to get an MRI to see if it was like a hairline fracture. She did not go in, which means I believe she's doing better. So there's good news on that front. Absolutely. That's awesome to hear. So, well, we're going to have a fun conversation today, you guys, about uh, the press conferences. There were five press conferences yesterday uh, as the Chargers have uh, maintained their OTA schedule. This is the second week of OTAs. Um, and just really briefly, I wanted to touch on the fact that uh, the Chargers got some extra veterans to uh, report to OTAs this week. Matt Filer, Chris Harris, Jerry Tillery, Justin Jones. Um, and I think I'm missing someone else, but uh, they all reported to OTAs this week, which means the Chargers are slowly getting to uh, 100% attendance before mandatory mini camp, which I think starts in a couple of weeks for them. Uh, so just wanted to, to point that out really quickly. Uh, but I think the right place to start here is the, the comments made by Kenneth Murray and Nasir Adderley. Um, you know, first and foremost, Kenneth Murray, you know, touched on his health. He said that he does feel like he's 100% healthy after uh, his January shoulder surgery, but he has not been fully cleared. Uh, but good news that he is healthy. But both Murray and Adderley pointed out that, you know, they felt kind of out of place in the Chargers' previous scheme, and they both feel like the new scheme is going to kind of unlock their potential, allow them to be more aggressive, and play more downhill, which is what uh, Kenneth Murray has talked about. So, um, I, Tyler, I think you had Kenneth Murray for a stat prediction um, uh, that, that we did on our, our live Q&A. So what was kind of your reaction uh, to hearing Kenneth Murray say, hey, man, like I'm ready to be more downhill. I'm ready to be more aggressive. Um, does that change any of your predictions? What do you think of that? I so my predictions were he'd about double his pass rush attempts and the pressures and sacks and whatnot. I don't think he had any sacks, maybe he had one, but um, he had one, yeah. So it, it doesn't really change a whole lot for me. Although I said that you know the jump between where he was at like six percent and where the the land the Rams linebackers blitzed last year at like 11 or 12 percent, like even just doubling that, it's not going to be like it's significant in the sense that it doubles, but I don't know how much, but. Yeah, I still think like Murray is a different linebacker than those guys. And that is what he does so well. It was very obvious to all of us. And granted, I don't know what his role would have been last season had Tranquil stayed healthy. Perhaps he would have had more attempts. Mm. But looking at Bradley's history through the years, it's unlikely. I don't think it would have been very significant. So, so to hear yeah. that he is going to play more downhill and that he's he's working on getting off of blocks and watching a lot of tape his best game with by far was against New England. He was just firing on all cylinders for whatever reason, maybe because Cam Newton can't pass the football. He just was attacking that line of scrimmage, and he played so well in that game. And if we can get more like that, I believe uh, Brian Balding just broke down that game a little bit on Twitter. Yeah. 
we can get more like that. I'm stoked. And, you know, one of the, the ways that Staley schemed guys open or schemed Aaron Donald one-on-ones was with Floyd and um, I forget number 41, but the other linebacker on that team and they would come off the edge and Donald would have his free one-on-ones. And if Murray is part of that equation to help someone like Joey Bosa get his one-on-ones, I think that's perfect. Not only do you have to actually, you know, take Murray into consideration when you're the quarterback or the offensive lineman or whatever, but it's also, you know, you're going to help out Joey Bosa. So I love the ripple effect. Let him do what he does best. And that frees up Joey Bosa. It's a win-win and it's music to my ears and music to his ears. And I never saw a happier guy, like, t- yeah. like openly trashed Gus Bradley, but not really. <laughs> yeah. like he was like, that sucked last year. I don't want to do that again. Right. I love this scheme. Please don't fire this coach. So I love what I'm hearing so far from him and I'm excited. Yeah. And I think part of the thing to consider is also that, you know, he was kind of playing injured last year and we mm-hmm. saw that mm-hmm. he did get some off season shoulder, uh, shoulder surgery, you know, I don't have like a super hot take on that other than, you know, if you are playing a whole season with a partially bummed shoulder, that may make your experience playing in a defense less enjoyable. Uh, <laughs> so I think that definitely is part of it. Yeah. So uh, it's good to hear that he's healthy and, you know, this team is going to need him uh, obviously with the departures of, of some of their key key linebackers last year, like Perriman and Vigil. So uh, I think he's going to step up and definitely take on a bit more of that pass rushing responsibility. Um, as for the Adderley part of it, you know, I think they're, his role, I think, more particularly with Derwin James being back, uh, is just to play that deep safety a little bit. I, you know, hope that he kind of, you know, is a better tackler. <laughs> That's really kind of what we're waiting on uh, in terms of seeing him live. So if he can come downhill a little bit uh, and, you know, just make good tackles, like that's honestly all I expect of him fr- from that standpoint. I don't expect him to be some elite ball hawk safety, but just be a good enough compliment to Derwin. And I, I think that would be a win. Yeah, it would be. And, you know, at some point in the offseason, we'll talk about, you know, breakout candidates. And I'm sure Adderley is going to be one of those players that we talk about. Um, but just getting back to Murray, you know, it, you could tell that like he wanted to trash Bradley, like he, he wanted to trash that oh, system. Yeah. And at every single turn, he was like, okay, like you could see the wheels <laughs> turning of like, all right, and you need to like pause and think about how I'm going to say this. Mm-hmm. Um, but he said himself, I, I, he said, I don't think I ever really felt comfortable in that defense. And, you know, we all said a bunch of times that we were just really confused on a week to week basis of how they were using Murray and really how they were not using him to the best of his skill set. Um, and Daniel Popper pointed this out in his article uh, to Tyler's point. You know, Kenneth Murray only blitzed 32 times last year. And Daniel Popper said that 25 of those came over the second half of the season. So, it, it, you know, just kind of looking back on things, I hate to keep trashing, you know, the previous regime, but it, it's so frustrating looking at the way they used Murray, the way they used Adderley, the way they, you know, I'm working on an article about Jerry Tillery as well. Um, and it's just going to be a refreshing change of pace to watch this coaching staff come in and use these players to their to their skill set and be able to put them in a position to succeed because, you know, to all of us, it made a lot of sense to draft Kenneth Murray and blitz him a lot, let him read and react, let him play downhill because that's what was, that's what he was so good at, at Oklahoma. So I'm really excited to see this rendition of, of Kenneth Murray. Um, And I'm, you know, I'm not generally in favor of the number change, but I, I like the way that he said, you know, that, you know, him getting back to Kent, to K9, as he says, and, and getting back into a defense that allows him to play downhill, maybe that's another boost in confidence. And so I'm really excited to see this rendition of Kenneth Murray in the Chargers defense. Yeah, and one of the ways that he was able to get onto the field so early. Uh, I mean, I'm wearing the 99 Bosa jersey, so you understand that I don't care about jerseys. Looks like yeah. you're a little delayed with Alex. Sorry about that, Tyler. It's all good. I think I have three jerseys in my closet that are all outdated and useless at this point. <laughs> if anyone would like a Melvin Gordon jersey, hit me up. You can have it. <laughs> I don't care. Don't need it. Um, what was I going to say? I don't remember. I don't remember, Alex. Sorry. <laughs> it's all good, man. It's all good. So um, in terms of Nasir Adley, you know, like I mentioned, you know, we, we'll cover him quite yeah. a bit, but it is notable that you know, he and Ronaldo Hill did imply that um, Nasir Adderley was going to be playing a little bit more in the cornerback position, maybe playing in the slot somewhat, um, which is what the Chargers were planning to do last season until Derwin James got hurt. You know, there were several reports that 
you know, he had been taking repetitions and in the slot cornerback position. And obviously, you know, that didn't pan out. He had to play single high safety so often that I think it really just didn't similar to Murray. It didn't allow him to play to the best of his abilities. And so we'll have to see. I think my biggest concern with Adderley is just that it never really felt like he trusted his instincts. So maybe that's Mm. a little bit of him being out of place and feeling out of place. So, you know, if they're able to use him as a cornerback a little bit more often, get him in coverage and kind of use him like their version of Minka Fitzpatrick and in, in like they do this with the Steelers, you know, I think that would be the, the best thing possible for him. I can't tell if Alex is delayed. I'm just waiting. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Um, yeah, no, I'm happy to see Adelaide takes a uh, slot corner or any kind of corner snaps in general. John Johnson played the fifth most slot snaps last season among starting safeties. Um, so I believe he'll kind of have something similar to that, I suppose. I guess if I'm looking at this defense, is Derwin, I mean, Derwin James is much better, but is Derwin James the Jordan Fuller of this defense and John Johnson is the Nasir Adderley? Is that how it's going to work? Because it, it feels like John Johnson was playing more of that deep safety role. And I assume, even though they'll kind of play interchangeably, that Fuller was more that closer to the line of scrimmage guy. So that's where Derwin James, Derwin James is going to play. Because I kept hearing all offseason that John Johnson and Derwin James were kind of redundant. And in some ways they are, but I kind of feel like, John Johnson is more Nasir Adderley and Jordan Fuller is more Derwin James. Does that make sense? Yeah, it, it does make sense. Um, you know, in talking with, with Ryan Dyer, who's obviously watched the Rams defense a lot more than, than, yeah. you know, I have, um, it, it seems like John Johnson and Jordan Fuller co- were kind of pieces that moved around quite a bit, mm-hmm. um, whether that's as, as a deep safety in the slot or in the box. And then they had, uh, I think it's Taylor Rapp or, or Caleb Rapp. Um, yeah. He was kind of their dime linebacker, Adrian Phillips, who would almost exclusively play in the box and in the slot. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, I think that's the, the kind of the beauty and the mystery of, of Brandon Staley's defense from what I've read is that everybody gets moved around. And Ryan, you know, I was texting with him a couple of weeks ago and, and he said that, you know, we might be seeing, you know, Chris Harris take some reps at safety and maybe even Asante Samuel Jr. taking reps at safety. Not a ton, but <laughs> just kind of, you know, exploiting their athleticism, their instinctiveness and, and matchups, frankly, you know, I think that's kind of the name of the game. And that's kind of been, you know, we've moved from versatility being the the buzzword to matchups being the buzzword and how <laughs> Brandon Staley is just trying to really use their all of their defensive players and offensive players to create mismatches so uh long long answer short is that derwin james and john johnson i think are very similar players in how they were used um obviously i think derwin's a little bit better of an athlete but i I do expect derwin to be kind of used as that chess piece being moved over all over the field more than any other player but i do think nas will take some reps in the slot and move out of safety but I think Derwin James is really going to, you know, be everywhere. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's understandable. Alex, I don't know if you're delayed, so I'm just going to keep talking. Um, <laughs> I was just looking at, you know, the numbers of the stats for these guys. I don't, it was like, I think John Johnson took 160 something snaps in the slot, whereas Rapp and Fuller were like 50 each or something like that. So I'm just trying to figure yeah. out like, who is going to be that more like slot kind of guy and who's going to be more whatever. I don't know. I'm, I'm so excited to figure out whoever the hell it is because it's good stuff. Yeah, I mean, I think they could have had, you know, Derwin James or, you know, uh, I mean, we talked a lot a lot about John Johnson and free agency. I, I think they were just more redundant, not from the way they played, but just from the way that they were both the signal caller. So, you know, I mean, you, you could have got a guy that was more familiar with Brandon Staley's defense, and I don't think that would have been a bad thing especially since he ended up not really costing anything uh yeah. now the chargers have all this salary cap space that they didn't use uh so that's fun but um so yeah we'll we'll see kind of how that pans out but I, I think just having you know both of them could have been a little redundant and then it just would have brought more questions of like are we going to use that earlier or are we not going to use them <laughs> you yeah. know so that that whole discussion when they let Rayshon walk so yeah i mean it's pretty clear that they trust in this year Adderley that they think that he has some untapped potential for them to be able to manifest and, and be able to use him as, as a key player. And, and it's, he's going to have to, right? Like, because this, we've talked a little bit about, you know, our concerns of the depth of the safety position or, or DB room, however you want to say it. Um, and frankly, they, they have four bodies who play safety. And so Nasir Adderley is going to have to be, you know, 
that kind of player. And so is Derwin James. So we'll move on to the next thing, which I thought was really interesting, which came from Joe Lombardi. Um, he was talking, he was asked about Mike Williams um, and he kind of explained it that Michael Thomas in new Orleans ha- was playing the X receiver role. And he was saying that Mike Williams is going to be that X receiver role. You can kind of look at it. Marcus, uh, Marcus Colston is another example of that. And so he thinks that there's going to be a big role for Mike Williams. And he said, quote, if I were a betting man, I'd bet on nice numbers coming from him on the stat sheet. That's for sure. So all three of us have been kind of skeptical about Mike Williams and, and you know, his long-term value for this team and whether or not the Chargers should have, should have cut him. Um, but if he's getting that X role and, you know, Joe Lombardi is predicting a big role for him, does that make you feel a little bit better? We'll start with Alex on this one. Does it make you feel a little bit better about his short-term and long-term future? No, because Michael Thomas is a much better receiver than Mike Williams. Um, and Mike yeah. Williams isn't a great route runner. Like, um, you know, not to take like the negative position. I do think that you can say Mike Williams will have a better uh 2021. Uh, but I kind of think he is what he is at this point. Like, yeah. I don't expect him to turn into this route running savant that is constantly creating problems for defenses. And I don't think that's a bad thing. Like I think his role on this team as it currently stands is fine. Uh, I I don't think he needs to do necessarily any more or less than he's doing on this one year deal that he's on. Like, and frankly uh, they do need him uh, you know, as the wide receiver too right now, unless they were to make some Julio move or something that's not going to happen. So that's, you know, what they need Mike Williams for. Uh, I, you know, if they're confident in him, they're confident in him. I just think it's a bit of a, he is what he is at this, you know, at this point situation, I don't think he's going to undergo significant development in the system. Um, but, you know, that doesn't necessarily make me more optimistic or pessimistic as to what a long-term contract with him, uh, with him would be. Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of the same on this. I feel like, the coaching staff has intentionally every time they bring up Keenan Allen, it's followed by Mike Williams. We're going to have two premium premium wide receivers, Keenan Allen and Mike Williams. We have two guys, Keenan Allen and Mike Williams. So it's always felt like with this staff that they are going to have like both guys, obviously one is better than the other, but they are going to try their best to get the most out of these guys. Duh. That's an offensive staff for you. The whole Michael Thomas thing, like my, okay. My understanding of an X receiver is you're a guy that's more like, you play in the sideline, you play in those deep routes, how yeah. do you be a little more physical? Whereas your Z's, you're more your Keenan Allen type, if you will, can play a little bit in the slot. So I don't know like how that whole Michael Thomas is the X and Mike Williams is the X kind of thing works because they feel so different. Right. I don't know. I traded for Michael Thomas last year from Alex and I wasted that incredibly <laughs> um, by coming in second to dead last on <laughs> fantasy football. So I didn't exactly get, you know, to figure out the Mike, uh, Mike Thomas experience, but um, I don't know. This doesn't do much to move the needle for me. It's yeah. interesting to hear those two. Like, if you told me, okay, you know, because we've been here saying all offseason, okay, Austin Eckler is like Alvin Kamara. So Keenan Allen is going to be like Michael Thomas. So it's just weird that they would have Mike Williams and Mike Thomas in that same sentence. But I don't know. We'll see. Joe Lombardi has kind of preached the whole offseason that, you know, yes, that was that was the, these guys in, in New Orleans and – I'm going to try to bring some of those things here, but those guys in new Orleans, you know, Drew Reese is not Justin Herbert. Right. And, you know, all these guys are not the same guys. There's obviously no Taysom Hill. Easton stick is not Taysom Hill. And so I'm just, it's, it's just weird to have him put Mike yeah. Thomas and Mike Williams together. It's, it's really like, it doesn't move the needle for me, I guess. Like I do think he's going to have a better year, but like, are they going to ask him to do more route running? And was it, was no one asking him to do that before? Or is he just actually the same guy? And it's kind of the same general role. Uh, this is a wait and see for me. I think it's a wait and see for me as well, because it, it was a confusing comparison. And I, and I don't think he was intentionally saying like, you know, these two players are comparable or anything like that because Michael Thomas, you know, we all make fun of him, but he ran like a million slants a game for the saints <laughs> in part because Drew Brees couldn't throw the football for more than 30 yards down the field. So mm-hmm. the, they might be playing like lining up at the X position, but they couldn't be, two more different players like Mike Mm -hmm. Williams as a jump ball guy, intermediate deep route guy, 
Michael Thomas, he can do deep ball stuff, but he's more of an over the middle route runner possession kind of receiver. So it is a little interesting to hear him say like, Hey, like, you know, I, I had this receiver who played the X role most recently and Mike Williams is going to be doing that same kind of thing. And so, you know, it, it is going to be very interesting to see how this all shakes out. And he mentioned again, like several others have that, you know, they're kind of trying to get a, a melding of the mind, so to speak, between what he was running in New Orleans and, and Detroit and what, you know, Shane Day has done in, in San Francisco. And so, you know, we don't, it, not everything is going to line up, you know, right across. I think the thing I think the, the comparison I feel most comfortable with, I think is the Camara role to the Austin Eckler role, mm -hmm. because I think those two have, have very similar skill sets in, in terms of usage and ability as a receiver. So in terms of pass catchers, like, I don't know, like it's going to be, so interesting to see how he uses all of these pieces. And he mentioned, you know, Donald Parham too, as somebody that he's, you know, they've never had, he's never been around a player like Donald Parham, a, a six, eight guy who, who's mm. really nimble on his feet. So it's just, it was a curious statement and I'm just really interested to see how it pans out. I don't know how much Mike Tom, I keep wanting to mix it up. Mike Thomas ran, but I, I pulled this from CBS. Uh, Mike Williams ran almost 30% of his routes were go routes. So again, like yeah. I don't, I don't think Mike Thomas was doing that. So it's still a very uh, interesting conversation for me, but um, if they want to create mismatches. Like Lombardi said, I'm all for it. And we can talk about those mismatches or however they're used. Um, I don't know. That, uh, we lost Alex. So I don't know what we're doing here. <laughs> it's okay. Hopefully we get Alex back in a second. Um, so the, the next thing that I, I know we did a whole episode pretty much on kickers, but you know, Darius Swinton went up in his press conference and said uh, uh, quite a few things that I think, you know, are, notice, are notable because, you know, the Chargers special teams were so bad last season. Um, and we, none of us really know anything about Tristan Viscaino. Like, we, we've seen one NFL game from him. He was a college kicker like three years ago. So no one really knows anything about him. But, you know, Darius Swinton said that he scouted him when he was coming out of college. He really liked him then. And then he really liked what he saw from his, you know, I, I think he said he was able to get practice tape. I don't know if that is a thing or not. Um, but also the one game from week 17 that Viscano kicked for the 49ers. And he said that uh, he's got a really strong leg. He said he really likes the way that he, you know, kicks the ball. His, mo his motion is fluid. I don't know enough about kickers to say different, <laughs> um, you know, but it is, you know, he did speak relatively highly about Viscano and Kessman as well. Um, you know, he was talking about Kessman as somebody who had a lot of leg talent and likes that he likes the way that he kicks the ball and the strength of his leg. And so, it seems like on paper, the Chargers have two players, inexperienced players who have really strong legs and need to kind of work on everything else. And then they have Michael Badgley, who is relatively accurate from 45 yards and in, but can't, you know, kick further than that and can't do kickoffs, which mm -hmm. is another thing that Swinton talked about. So Tyler, any takeaways from Swinton's conversation about kickers that you wanted to mention here? Yeah, um, Alex and I have a bet, and that bet might be off in a matter of months <laughs> because, uh, yeah, I, I, the, the coaching staff so far, at least with Staley, they haven't really lied to us. He says, I want to be a line of scrimmage team. So they go get an offensive lineman. Yeah. What kind of corner do you like? I like guys who can play man and who can tackle, and they go get Asante Samuel Jr. So if he's saying, this Swinton is saying, I like kickers who can do kickoffs and you know be an actual field goal kicker, then Badgley's out. Like then, then I believe them. Yeah, because they've been pretty honest with us, and I think it comes down to one of those two other guys. So, um, I'd love Badgley to you know it's a good competition for sure. They have a mix of things: a, a undrafted free agent, a guy with a game, and a guy with more games but a weaker leg. So I do like that competition, and I do think that Swinton will pick the best guy for the job and what they want to do. Um, but yeah, Badgley's stock is going down after that one. If you want someone who can handle kickoffs. It ain't Badgley. Um, no. Tylon can do it, he's, but it doesn't seem like he wants to do that anymore. I don't know how much you need to practice like punting and kickoffs. Like to me, it's just like get ball, kick ball. And it just like, as long yeah. as it goes in between the two, the 53 yard you know, width of the field, you're okay. So I don't know how much like Tylon could improve now that he doesn't have to do kickoffs, but uh, we'll see. But stock down on Badgley for sure. Absolutely. And, you know, I, I, all of us are rooting for Badgley, right? I, I think, you know, if he makes a team, obviously the, the kicker position is, is someone that is important that you're, you're rooting for, you know, Adam Vinatieri just retired and, and mm. he's 
believe it or not, he's the all-time leader in points scored for any NFL player ever. So, you know, whoever wins the kicker battle, because it, we will be rooting for them. And it, it does just seem like that Michael Badgley is on his way out and they mm-hmm. just, they wanted to kind of make, they wanted to do their due diligence and make sure that they weren't cutting him too early. looks like we finally got Alex back here. So hopefully we, we got some good internet there as well. Um, but it just seems like they wanted to do their due diligence due diligence and make sure that you know they weren't cutting Michael Badgley too soon like we talked about you know with the Josh Lambeau and uh Young Way Koo situation but you know we'll have to see what what happens with the kicker uh the kicker battle I know uh we lost you there for a second Alex but any other thoughts you know we, we kind of talked about you know Swinton mentioning the kickoff duties for that he wants it to keep you know between the same person whoever's handling the place kicking duty. So any other thoughts on uh, Michael Badgley versus Viscaino and Alex Kessman that we didn't really already talk about? Yeah, I think Michael Badgley should be cut. Um, <laughs> just like, frankly, straight up, uh, just the comment that he made about, you know, not separating the kicker from the kickoff, like that just made me think he should be kind of gone. And like, you know, and I know there are other teams that do the kickoff specialist thing. We've seen this in San Francisco with, uh, Bradley Pinion, who kicks for Robbie Gold because he's 96 years old, uh, and you probably shouldn't have him handling kickoff. Um, so that's kind of one thing. But you know, the doing it with Badgley, I just think doesn't make you know a whole lot of sense. If you can't kick off, you can't kick off, and it's not like he's getting beat yeah. out by like some stud kicker with in terms of Ty Long. Uh, you know, who came from the CFL a couple of years ago and can kick five yards better on a kickoff on average the last two years. Um, so that's kind of like just my concern. And, you know, there is a bit of, I feel, coddling that's been going on the last two years with Michael Badgley um, and just saying that, you know, he we never challenged him really in 2019 or 2020 uh, with kind of an external competition. And I think we saw... Some of the results of that, um, you know, I, I don't think that, you know, we should just hand Kessman or somebody the job. Obviously, they have big legs, but they could bomb in the preseason. Uh, yeah. it, it just feels like they're kind of in an uncomfortable fallback position here with Badgley. And I don't really see a whole lot of risk in cutting him, uh, or at least not the amount of risk that other people do. Like, oh, he may not, you know, who knows what Kessman's going to do from 30 to 40. But it's like, yeah, but you don't know, <laughs> you kind of know what Badgley is like if you're afraid to make the change i just feel it's going to continue you know be what continues to hold the special teams back uh, a little bit when we talk about all these guys yeah i'm glad that you mentioned 2019 because you know i seem to recall that they when he was injured they brought in chase mclaughlin and mclaughlin was really good and, and you know he was a much better kicker at least in terms of percentage during that time than badgley was as it pertains to ty long it certainly seems that ty long's job is safe you know, we haven't really heard anything yeah. about um, Shane Lachlan or, you know, that being a legitimate competition. They, they have said that they're, they are having a competition there, but, you know, we've heard almost nothing so far about uh, Shane Lachlan and he was on the team for the, like the last month of the season too. So um, whether or not, you know, just focusing on punting helps Ty Long, I think they certainly think that that will. And I, I, I know that Ty Long did not have a great season last year, But to me, you know, it seems like they view Ty Long's struggles last year more about being more about the lack of protection and maybe being a little overworked by also handling kickoffs. So um, in my opinion, I think Ty Long will have a a much better season this year, um, you know, just based off of the protection and hopefully not being overworked too much. God, I hope so. Can we talk about another special teams guy, sort of, depending on his role? um is kind of jumping now but Lombardi was asked about Joe Reed and yeah. I, I I mean the, the the quote is I like what I've seen so far he's breaking the huddle and lining up in the right spots I'm optimistic for him and that was like the end of the talk about Joe Reed is this dude making the team like <laughs> that was a horrendous endorsement he's wax poetic about the other receivers and everyone else yeah. in the team and with Joe Reed it's like well he's lining up in the right spots this year yeah, that, that was a tough one. And, and I think, yeah, you know, I think at that point, maybe Lombardi was a little bit tired of like talking about mm. you know, like who's standing out in OTAs, which, you know, they're not really doing much, but I mean, he could have talked about like 
what he was seen in one-on-ones and things like that but sure. to just only say oh he's finally lining up in the right <laughs> spots it it was a little concerning for sure and you know unfortunately once they drafted Josh Palmer you know it, it kind of put him on the outs and you know I would have loved to see them use him more often last season but you know this coaching staff has no allegiance to him and they have no tape on him so mm. um, unfortunately it does seem you know barring a, a drastic improvement in training camp you know, we'll have to see because I think, you know, Nasir Adderley could, can absolutely do the the kickoff returns. I know Tyron Johnson did some, some reps there as well in training camp. So, you know, they, they drafted Reed essentially to start out as a, as a special teams guy and, and then it didn't even work out. So uh, not a great, not a great day for Joe Reed for sure. I, I would say when Tyron Johnson was able to come on the field in week four and do Joe Reed's better or do Joe Reed's job better than he did as a kick returner, uh, that was like kind of when the Joe Reed thing sort of ended for me. I mean, obviously, you know, you hope for development, but like, you know, you you either have the special team spot or you don't. And it didn't seem like the last administration that drafted him with a fifth round pick had the confidence in him, you know, four weeks into the season. Uh, So, you know, why should a new coaching staff that just drafted a receiver, you know, I mean, obviously Telesco drafted him, but, you know, this new coaching staff certainly had serious um, input on that. So, you know, um, I I think Joe Reed has some skills that obviously people will. But I just don't think you can force a new coaching staff to use uh, a player that the previous coaching staff didn't even really like using. Yeah, it, it is unfortunate that, you know, because we, the three of us, you know, at the time when, when Jason was here, you know, we sat and did that film room on Joe Reed and it was like, okay, I can see some things here. Maybe he can have a role and maybe develop into like that kind of Debo Samuel kind of player. Um, but, you know, the, the San Francisco influence obviously has that kind of role. But the Saints, you know, they that that was Alvin Kamara's job. Alvin Kamara mm-hmm. was the guy who would go in motion and take jet sweeps and do all these things. And so if they're gonna use Austin Eckler or Justin Jackson in that kind of role, then I don't I don't see a spot for Joe Reed. And, and you know, there is the kind of elephant in the room is like we don't we don't know if they're gonna carry five receivers or six. If they carry five receivers, Joe Reed is probably gone. I figured well. Uh, no, they always carry six, right? Like, uh, have they ever carried five? Has there ever been a number that low for the Chargers? Well, I mean, I'd have to look at it. But like, I'm pretty sure that there was only five throughout most of the season last year because Joby was inactive on game days quite a bit. Yeah, okay, on game day, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, on game day, yes. Yeah, yeah I don't know. So someone tell us in the comments. <laughs> Yeah, if you guys know that one, please let us know. Um, so I don't know if you guys have any other thoughts here from the press conferences yesterday. Um, the other thing that was kind of talked about was, you know, outside of Rashawn Slater, most of the rookies are taking reps with the second team uh, offensive teams and defensive teams, and that includes Asante Samuel Jr. Um, Daniel Popper pointed out that uh, Brandon Faison and Ryan Smith were kind of the – were the – the third corners off the bench after Michael Davis and, and Chris Harris. Um, hmm. I wouldn't make too much out of that. Just kind of, you know, maybe trying to work those players in a little bit more, make them earn the roles. Um, but definitely worth pointing out there. Yeah. I mean, it just concerns me, I guess what they, what their depth really at corner is if we're talking about, you know, Ryan Smith and Brandon Faison potentially having to come into the game if they need to, you know, have an injury, obviously potentially with Chris Harris, or uh, if they need to do something with Asante Samuel Jr. Like, you know, cool. You can put Asante Samuel Jr. in safety though. I don't really want Brandon face on, on the field. <laughs> um, so that's kind of a problem, you know, I think, and he, yeah. I know that the Staley defense is predicated on obviously him liking all of these players and using every single piece. Um, but I guess my thing with the cornerback room is just, I think they're, are some guys that just should kind of be depth um obviously ryan smith will have the the special teams role uh, of being the special teams ace but like yeah I, I just think you shouldn't get to that point uh, really where they're going to be you know potential starters if one guy goes down 
Yeah, I mean, other than Asante Samuel Jr., I mean, it's kind of obvious everyone would be the second string guy. I don't, yeah. Is Trey McKitty second string? Is he playing with the second team? Yeah. Do we know? Oh, okay. Well, that's not bad. Um, Asante Samuel Jr., he'll probably just earn it and make his way up. So as long as he's progressing towards you know that eventual starting spot, this is nothing for me. Yeah, you know, it seems like, we're, you know, we're kind of figuring out figuring out who certain players, how, what kind of roles they'll, they'll be able to fill. Um, I mean, I saw they said junior is going to start like, you know, there's, there's no reason to believe that Ryan Smith and Brandon face are going to start and be the third corners off the bench. So um, I, I'd be surprised if Asante Sammy junior was not starting, but it just NFL coaches like to make sure that outside of first round picks, their rookies are all, you know, kind of earning the spots, earning their stripes. And, you know, I expect that to be the case with Asante Sammy junior. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and Joe Lombardi talked very highly of, of Josh Palmer as well. So uh, kind of getting back to that receiver conversation said that Palmer is very consistent, very well-rounded can do a lot of the things that they like and, and you know, uh, gave a little nod to his mature demeanor and said that he's somebody that uh, stays after practice and works with uh, Justin Herbert and, and Chase Daniel. So um, unlike Joe Reed, Josh Palmer got some, some good reviews from Joe Lombardi. Great. Show me on the field. I mean, I love all this talk. It's great for headlines and articles. <laughs> Show me on the field. Let me see in the preseason. Yeah, I mean, that's sort of the position I'm kind of in with OTAs at this point and like yeah. trying to hype certain players up. Like, yeah, we all kind of know Rayshon Slater is going to be good. I, I didn't need to see first, you know, him getting first team reps for, you know, for me to know uh, he would kind of be the starter going into the season. You know, um, I, I guess we'll sort of find out deeper in OTAs who really some of these depth guys, you know, end yeah. up being uh, towards the end of that roster. But, you know, I'm, I'm also not like heavily as concerned with like the Joe Reed comment, because like, you know, Joe Reed, even if he does make this roster is just supposed to be a back of the roster guy like you know i think yeah. at this point he would probably just be wide receiver five or six so like i don't think you know uh lombardi being like well he's in you know he lines up in the right place is such a bad thing because if you're a wide receiver five or six that's all you're supposed to do <laughs> you're probably not getting the ball thrown your way a lot so i, I do think that that was just kind of my thought uh, on a lot of those like guys at the end of the roster obviously you know it's been complete silence on someone like kj hill uh, it, who knows yeah. if that guy even exists anymore? Uh, maybe he went the Eli Stove route where I get excited for him and then he's not on the team. Don't know. Uh, but uh, I do think that it's just the lower tier guys at the end of the roster that, uh, that this kind of session is really for. I don't know if we're going to learn a lot about who the top tier guys are, partially because we already know that like Asante Samuel Jr. has to start. And if he's not starting, then this team is in a lot of trouble, but yeah. I don't think this this week is really a, a big indication that he's suffered some kind of setback or something. No, absolutely not. I, I think you know this team is not—they don't even have a helmet on right now, so it, everything is walked through in individual drills. To me, the more interesting conversations are, are like the X's and O's talks about, like you know, getting Kenneth Murray more downhill and and the kicking thing. You can't like that's something that coaches can you know get ready for and prepare for. Because, you know, kickers don't need pads and helmets. They, they don't they don't hit anyone. So I think, you know, certain things are, are absolutely worth talking about during the OTAs. And um, but in terms of like finding specific roles for these players, you know, we'll know we'll know much more about that in training camp and the preseason. Um, and then as the season goes along. So, uh, Tyler, Alex, any other thoughts before we wrap up today's show? Final thought for me is that Joe Lombardi talk. I mean, every freaking offensive corner talks about creating mismatches, but you know, Austin Eckler was used in the slot or out wide 27% of the time in 2018 and 2019, 2020 that dropped to 19%. And he's a guy who, you know, only two drops, 104 targets in 2019, 10.8 yards per catch, 2.74 yards per route run, um, which put him second in NFL among starting receivers. Yeah. And so for this, for this guy, like put Keenan, or not Keenan on, Put Austin Eckler out there, get him back to his role, get those mismatches. And the last thing I want to say is part of the reason I'm concerned about that Joe Reed comment is if I'm not mistaken, last season they talked about he couldn't figure out the playbook. And that's partially why he couldn't get on the field. So I don't know if he's still struggling to get there. So for that, for a diff, two different coaching staffs to be like, uh, he's trying to figure out how to line up in the right spot. And like, oh, yay, now he's finally doing that. I'm a little bit worried. 
Yeah, I thought the Joe Reed thing was more about his route running last year. I might be wrong mm. about that, but maybe it's a route running problem and other problems. Uh, yeah. <laughs> We'll have to see and find out in the in the preseason ultimately. Um, the the one last comment I had is that Steven said that you know kickers don't put pads on and don't hit anyone. Uh, yeah, well Michael Badgley doesn't hit anyone or anything, uh, frankly. So yeah, <laughs> get off the team. I love Alex's kicker takes, man. It, it, it's it's amazing, truly outstanding stuff there. Um, all right, guys, that's going to do it for us today. Uh, we've got some really fun episodes planned for you over the summer. Uh, we're going to talk, you know, just kind of general NFL takes and, and build some most valuable uh, offensive line units and quarterback units and secondary units. So it's going to be a lot of fun um, just kind of taking into consideration, you know, the overall, you know, grasp of who these players are in the league. I think it's going to be a fascinating conversation once we get there. So as always, make sure and leave us a rating or review. We do really appreciate all of your support. Um, especially the YouTube crowd, you know, we, we are seeing more subscribers each and every day. And we do really appreciate that. Uh, keep doing that. Keep liking the videos and commenting and letting us know uh, what you think of our takes and stuff like that. And, we, and like I said, we do really appreciate that support and we'll see you guys next time.